Brook Bonesaw. I'm here to talk to you today about bonsai. It's a, a horticultural art that came from the Far East. Bonsai, pronounced bone as in the bone in your arm, and sigh as in a nice deep sigh, originally started in China. In China it's called Nanjing, and moved from China to Japan uh, in the early 12 to 1300 time frame. It was an art form in Japan that was practiced by the Buddhist monks and then subsequently by the ruling class in Japan. Uh, common people were not allowed to have bonsai until later on in Japan's history. When Japan became opened up in the 1850s to trade with uh, the Western world, then bonsai began to make their way to Europe, predominantly Germany, the Netherlands, uh, and those countries. It really didn't make much of an impact in the United States until after World War II, when many of the servicemen coming home from World War II brought back many of the Japanese art forms, furniture, ikebana, uh, Zen gardening, Japanese gardening, they also brought back bonsai. Since then, it has slowly gained a foothold in, in the United States and is now probably at its zenith, its most popular. It's an art form that relies on horticulture as its base, so that, for example, this is a, a Fukien tea that is probably 30 to 40 years old. Um, the first requirement in growing this as a bonsai, of course, is to keep it alive. The second requirement is to keep it in very nice shape. Any good bonsai has as its design shape a form based on an irregular triangle that you can see very clearly in this tree. So one of the ways that you would maintain this tree is by pinching and pruning. And this is the practice of pinching. So as new growth comes out, you pinch it back and help form these layers of, of uh, foliage, which the Chinese would call floating clouds. Now we're going to talk about styles of bonsai, different styles and the different shapes. This is a redwood, a true redwood tree, a sequoia sempervirens. It's 36 years old, 37 years old actually. And if it were in nature, it would probably be probably 50 or 80 feet tall by now, if not taller. Going in a nice ceramic pot. Characteristic of a formal upright is an absolutely dead straight tree pure straight. Nice taper to the trunk. This is intended to look like it was lightning struck at top and then it has this nice foliage throughout. So this is a redwood tree in the formal upright style. I'll show you another tree in a slightly different style. It's also a formal upright. This is a cork bark elm. Uh, also formal upright a slightly different type of formal upright. This is called a broom style. It's intended to look more like um, what the Native American elm tree might have looked like. You'll notice that the bark is very corky. But again, the very straight trunk. Um, this particular tree is about 30 years old. It's been growing in a bonsai pot this size uh, since 1977. Its foliage is turning a little bit yellow because it's getting ready to go to sleep for the winter, so it's turning its colors. So these are the formal upright styles. The next style that we're going to talk about is informal upright. This is also an elm. This is a Chinese elm in the informal upright. In this particular case, the trunk is not that straight. Uh, this one is really quite sinuous. This is a Chinese elm that was imported from China about three months ago. Uh, in early 1999, and it's probably on the order of about 20 years old. Um, elms are probably the easiest tree to grow, and this one, as you can see, has this light green foliage. That's all new growth. A very, very robust grower. This is also an informal upright. This is, as most of you know, a Japanese maple. 
this normally has a very green leaf uh, for a color, and uh, it too is getting ready to go to sleep. This is an outdoor bonsai. So it is now turned red, and uh, I expect a little bit more of a colorful fall foliage. This particular tree was imported from Japan, um, and it's probably in the order of about 10 to 12 years old. This is a slanting tree. This is a Japanese white pine. Um, and you can see the design is such that it slants out this way. Um, this is an evergreen. Uh, it has a slightly bluish tinge to its, its needles. It's also an outdoor bonsai. And this particular tree was also imported from Japan. It's a white pine, Pinus parviflora, grafted on a black pine base um, because the black pine makes this nice scaly bark. So this is a really handsome tree. This is a cascade. Um, this is a Chinese elm that again was imported from China in early 1999. It's in a very ornate Chinese pot. As it gets a little older and gets a little bit fuller, um, it will cascade down below the level of the pot and really look very, very handsome. So this is a Chinese elm cascade. Not all of these trees come from far off places like China. This is a common rosemary growing in a cascade style. Again, a characteristic of a cascade is it's in this tall pot and it's intended to look like a tree cascading down over the cliffs, much as you might see along Lake Champlain or the ocean front. So this is uh, rosemary. You can use it not only for bonsai, but in your cooking as well. So this tree is an example of mame. Mame really isn't a style as much as it is a size. And while this tree looks like a full-grown tree, it's a slanting style, it's actually very small. This is an elm called seiju elm. It's a Japanese form. It makes a very, very nice small tree. It has a cousin called Hokkaido elm, which is even smaller and has the smallest leaf of any elm that I know of. So these are mame. Mame being again, more of a size and a style, but they're in a separate category all by their own. This particular tree is probably about eight years old. There is another style of bonsai called the forest style or group planting. This is an example of a forest style. These are Lawson cypress, which is actually a false cypress, growing on a slab of rock. In Japan and in Asia, all the forest plantings have an uneven number of plants. So in this case, this is a group planting of five plants called forest planting or group planting. So those are the styles of bonsai. The formal upright, the informal, the slanting. There's also a, a form of slanting called windswept, and then cascade, and last but not least, the little guys, mame. This is a Chinese elm. This is by far the easiest of the indoor trees to, to grow. You could logically separate bonsai into two kinds of trees, indoor and outdoor. The indoors are tropicals, and here in Vermont, they would prefer people kinds of temperatures. They all need lots of light, lots of sun. Um, this tree, the Chinese elm, which comes in lots of different sizes and shapes, is by far the easiest to grow. It's the most forgiving in terms of watering. Uh, it grows very quickly and is very, very handsome. These would be Kyoto sarissas that have not yet been worked into bonsai. And then when they're first created as bonsai, they might look something like this. And they will then mature and fill back in until they look like a, a more mature tree. This is not a Kyoto sarissa, it's a wild sarissa. But this was created as a bonsai early in 1999, and in about four or five months it's filled right out. So, this is an example of pre-bonsai or raw material, I guess. One of the ways of grooming bonsai trees is called pinching and pruning, so a lot of times you'll just see me pinching off the new growth. 
that's how you keep them in shape. So this is a Fukien tea from China. And if you look very, very carefully, you'll see a nice, simple white flower. This is a new plant that I found. It's also a Fukien tea, but you'll see that the leaves are very, very small compared to the last one that I just showed you. And strangely enough, its name is Little Leaf Fukien Tea. And not only did this one make flowers, but if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that it also made a little berries. One of the few that I've had has made these berries. If you pinch, then you don't have to cut. So because this wasn't maintained properly, now it needs to be cut back. So by trimming it back like this, I actually help the tree become more compact. So what you do is you just pinch off the new growth. And if you do this routinely, then you won't have to cut it back like the last one. But you'll notice I'm not pinching off flower buds. If it's grown too far, you won't be able to pinch. You'll have to cut. It just won't pinch off. And it'll be too strong. So, what you're doing is you're pinching it to keep it from growing and to help it become more compact. Probably the second easiest to grow is a wild sarissa. And again, these come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So, this will be two examples. So, these are wild sarissas. This is a little guy, this one's slightly bigger. Um, again, these make a very nice, simple white flower. And in a little bit we'll see some bigger ones and you'll know why it has a nickname. Its nickname is Tree of a Thousand Stars. These are native to the bogs in Southeast Asia. And they like high heat, lots of humidity. Uh, so they can be outdoors in the summertime. And uh, if it was 100 degrees and 100% humidity, they would think they were in heaven. So these are wild sarissas. So I had shown earlier these uh, wild sarissas and said that the nickname was Tree of a Thousand Stars. And this is why they're called Tree of a Thousand Stars. You can see that they get relatively covered with a very simple white flower. Really very pretty, very handsome. This particular tree is probably on the order of 25 to 30 years old. And again, it was imported from China. I had shown earlier there were some small Fukien teas. And this is currently probably my favorite tree at the moment. This is a Fukien tea. It was imported from China in early 1999. And again, probably on the order of 30 to 40 years old. And uh, just a very, very elegant design, this very triangular design, and a really nice uh, Japanese blue pot. So this came in as sort of a pre bonsai and was potted up and created here.
shortwave from Millbrook Bonsai, we meet artist Julie Longstreth at her studio and tag along one morning for a field study on amphibians and reptiles on Mount Mansfield. if you can, um, uh, as a job for two years. I went through uh, the Women's Small Business Program at Trinity and thereafter I decided that I had to officially call myself an artist as a business person. Um, but I've always made things. I've not always done it as a job though. So for two years, I think. When we renovated our farmhouse, I started getting interested in uh, ceramic tile because I wanted to um, put tiles down on our floor and so I've started to try um, combining my painting interest uh, with ceramic by creating a canvas out of tiles and then and then I'm now experimenting with glazes that will help me affect painting um, which is difficult because um, when you're doing ceramic glazing you're really layering glazes and they're never the same color um, when you put them on as they come out when they're fired. So it involves a lot of test firing and often I learn the hard way from my mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm getting more and more into that. And I just, I always like to experiment with new things. And that's another um, thing that I've learned over the past two years is that you've always got to have enough inventory to sell, but uh, I think the artistic mindset is to want to experiment with new things all of the time. And so it takes a fair amount of discipline to say, okay, today I'm just working in clay. I'm not going to go outside and paint that barn down the road that because it's beautiful out. And that's always a tug for me is staying focused on one medium. Because um, I do uh, t-shirts, I do clay, I do you know ceramic tile, salt and pepper shakers, and I do uh, watercolor, and I'm starting to do some oil, and I've got this pastel over here, so it's just, it's very hard, that's my biggest challenge, is not wanting to go in new directions Well, I think I'll, it'll just sort of come into my head that day that, oh, I've got this old door, and I really want to oil paint today, um, but... Uh, then inevitably that same image might appear in clay, you know, two weeks later. And so I think it works well for me to work back and forth from three dimensions to flat. And I don't really put that much pressure on myself um, to say which day is which. And I'm trying more and more to follow my gut because then it's clear and I have a better result on that day. I'd, I'd rather just be selling originals, um, but oftentimes, you know, Manufacturing is a way I think artists can make um, more money and allow themselves to make more originals, you know, to buy themselves that time. And I think also because there are so many different ways now to reproduce an image yeah. that it gets, and it's changing all the time and changing pretty quickly. Right. That right. Uh, that's part of it, the difficulty. Right. Um, I started volunteering uh, for uh, the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Project run out of Middlebury College uh, a couple of years ago as well because I have an interest in the environment and have always worked either in archaeology or in field biology or anthropology and I wanted to somehow um, stay in touch with that part of my life so I volunteered for this um, amphibian project and I I'm always out looking at salamanders and frogs, and so a lot of my artwork has um, been inspired by those trips to the field and seeing brightly colored newts and toads in the landscape. Um, but I also do uh, historic architecture um, in watercolor. Right now, the whole um, amphibian thing has gotten 
larger than life. Like, <laughs> the, the bright orange newts have always been, and to me, I mean, even growing up hiking um, in the mountains, I would, you know, move each newt to the side of the trail, and I continue to do that now in, um, on the dirt roads around here. In the springtime, they're always out, and it's something about their color that's so out of place uh, in the Vermont landscape, which is so green, and I just, I love color, so when I see something like that, and also things that are vulnerable, I mean, it's the same thing with a barn, I think, that's falling down, um, and a subdivision going up, that architecture is somehow uh, vulnerable, just like a small salamander crawling across the road, you know. So those are have always been attractions to me, and I think my interest in animals um, sort of across the country changes, you know, like when I lived out west it was the muskox. <laughs> so it really, I just latch on to certain ones and they this will change, I'm sure, but I can't push it. You know, it's still working for me, so I'm going to stick with it. Nice. I see you signing everything Maui. Oh, yeah. Well, my maiden name is Mauer, and all growing up, people called me Maui, and I've always signed my artwork Maui, and I just figured, you know, that it's kind of a neat artist name, and it's also something I think people would remember more than Julie Longstreth, so... At this point in my career, I'm Maui. It's short, and I think people will remember it. Um, and I'm also, actually, this after this handcrafter show, I'm going to spend the winter um, getting ready for, I'm going to do a show of architectural portraits at the Daily Bread in May. And that will lead up to open studio weekend on Memorial Day. So it'll be great to have people sort of seeing the things I do um, out in the public and then maybe be interested enough to come up to the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to put salt and pepper shakers on the table, so I'll have a bunch of things going on there. Um, this is a local building, probably recognized, the Joanville Academy Schoolhouse. Um, and that's actually been made into cards. I think the statement for me comes out afterwards. It's not like I'm trying to say save the newt or anything like that um, because I'm just not that kind of a person. But I like to um, think that, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there that notice these creatures, but they don't really think about that aspect of it. Um, and I just sort of like being humorous, too, in that, you know, most people look at Vermont and the first image that comes to mind is Green Mountains, Holstein cow, and you know I'm tired, frankly, of seeing the Holstein cow on sweatshirts. Even though you know when it first started, it was great. It's just interesting, maybe to take more of a microscopic look look at things that there are other creatures in our environment, and they deserve, um, you know, the same sort of attention. And I mean, all of my things, even though I don't always go after this sort of whimsical look. And in fact, it kind of bothers me that all my things are sort of whimsical, but I just, I wish they could be more serious somehow, but they never come out that way. So I'm, you know, starting to just realize that that may be where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. um, and the architecture, I think, is maybe less of my, maybe more of my serious side coming out. And in the clay, I think it's definitely my humorous side coming out. One thing is, is that I've always been interested in um, education, you know, and so I think part of the idea between tying my experience with the amphibians out in the field um, to my artwork is just to, to expose people to new things and to sort of cultivate awareness for the outdoors and just to be looking and aware when you're outside. And I think education has always been a part of my artwork that I don't really create artwork that you can't look at. I want people to look at it and um, have a warm feeling from it. So, and I, I mean, with the historic architecture, I think it's something that all the things that I make are really meaningful to me, and I think I couldn't do it any other way, you know. And I, ha I think I have a hard time when people... Um, commissioned me to do something that I'm not so interested in or, or really care about. Uh, 
that's also another challenge, and I think it probably is for most artists. Um, How do you overcome that? Uh, you just have to go. You have to. <laughs> you just have to give yourself more time, I think, and. Uh, to think how to approach that challenge. And then it, it gets you to be more creative, I think, um, to come around and make something out of uh, an object or um, something that maybe you don't have as strong a belief in. And it doesn't happen that often, but occasionally it's, it's hard. <laughs>